Okay, let's now see how to scan an object using our copy 3D uh, through the software Vertex Pro. Um, so we have the scanner connected and on, and we are also using the rotary table in order to move in a faster way uh, the object. Of course, the scanner is calibrated uh, uh, and ready to be used. Um, so here we have a very uh, easy interface with four buttons, start a new job, enter the database and recover an old job, uh, enter the service menu and leave the software. Let's see uh, a short explanation of the uh, uh, service menu. Here is to come back to the welcome screen. Here is to set a few icons. Uh, so for example, we can set, uh, we can specify the, the folder where we are going to save the projects. Uh, the suggestion is to always save uh, on a local folder, uh, not saving on a remote one. Uh, we can activate and turn off also the auto save mode uh, when it's on. Here is the uh, time uh, period. Each, every 10 minutes the software uh, saves in an automatic way the new uh, data. If I turn it off, then I have to save manually. Uh, if I type zero uh, on the other side, it saves uh, at each um, step. I can also decide or not to uh, acquire with colors. The scanner is able to acquire the texture of the object so I can turn it on and off depending on what I have to do with the data coming from the scanner. Of course, I can specify, I can decide for the language of the interface. I can uh, uh, modify the dimension of the icons, enter and handle the listens. Uh, and then I can also uh, decide, uh, specify some additional parameters like the color of the background, the color of the uniform color of the point clouds, and also the uniform color of the meshes. So mm, a few normal standard parameters that at the end uh, have uh, to be set uh, at the beginning, uh, and then uh, maybe sometimes you, uh, you go uh, and touch and turn on or off the color acquisition, but the rest remains uh, uh, always the same. Here is the tool for uh, loading the file, uh, the scanner file uh, configuration file. Uh, this is uh, something that you have to do when you install first time on a new computer, the scanner, and this is for uh, giving to the software the file, including all the parameters of the scanner. Then the software is able to try to connect uh, to the hardware. Uh, so in case everything works, then you see the live session here. In case it, do it doesn't work for some reasons, then you can read uh, the uh, message coming from the software and you can uh, go and check uh, what uh, the message says. So for example, cameras not connected to a USB 3 port or not connected uh, at all, or uh, projector not working with the, good, uh, the, the, the needed uh, good parameters. Here you have to the tool for the wizard for defining a new field of view. Every time you want to change the uh, uh, scanner field of view, you have to follow everything you find under this wizard. Here you have the tool for calibrating the scanner, so the cameras and the projector. Okay, so for defining all the scanning parameters, depending on the field of view, you have to use uh, uh, one of the three patterns coming with the calibration plate. Here you can calibrate the position of the rotary table in order to then run uh, acquisition, multi-session acquisition, multi-view acquisition, and uh, aligning uh, together in an automatic way all the point clouds. And here you can calibrate the color. Uh, we are talking only about the color applied to the point clouds and so to the meshes. So it's a calibration not affecting the accuracy and repeatability of the scanner. We just define the color to be applied to the point clouds. Uh, it is needed when you want to acquire uh, a good color of the surface. Uh, this calibration is done automatically at the end of the uh, scanner calibration. But of course, every time we want to acquire a good color, the best is then to uh, run uh, this calibration uh, before starting the scan. It's a fast calibration. It's enough to place a piece of white paper or the calibration plate in front of the cameras, then click on the OK button. It projects the three main colors, and then the calibration is done. Um, I say it's better uh, in order to get good colors to run the calibration before starting the scan be because uh, uh, 
yes, uh, at the end, the color of an object is depending on the light that you have in your room. So if you did the calibration yesterday uh, with, different, uh, with a different light in your room, uh, then uh, the parameters calculated, estimated yesterday are not good enough for scanning now with a different light. So you do this calibration before starting the scan, and you do that calibration every time you change uh, in a certain way the uh, light conditions of, of the uh, room where you're scanning. And then here you have some uh, uh, ways to uh, control the light projected by the projector and the acquisition done by the cameras, uh, but uh, we will see the three uh, parameters during the scanning phase. So uh, it's everything about the uh, service menu. We can come back to the welcome screen and start a new job because we want to scan uh, the helmet on the rotary table. So let's call the project helmet. And then we click on OK, and we start. Here we have the interface of the scanner. So here we have uh, a window where uh, all the point clouds will appear, all the meshes will appear, all our data will be listed here. And uh, here we have the main viewer where uh, all the 3D results will be uh, um, displayed. And here we have all the, uh, let's say, the uh, features uh, to be used for running the scanner. Here is to open the main menu where we can save the project, we can open the project folder, we can go to the service uh, page or return home. So it's a service button. And here we have all the buttons needed for uh, scanning something. From the left to the right, at the end, you have uh, uh, the required workflow for starting from nothing. Okay, so um, now in case, uh, we want to scan something. Here we have the two icons for uh, starting and scan process. The first one is for acquiring uh, um, single point clouds. Uh, it is used when the scanner um, is working alone without the rotary table, maybe because the object is a big object. So we move the scanner around uh, the object and we want only to acquire single scans. So at the end, here we will see a list of single scans to be uh, then used as single scans. Or better, uh, if we use the table or not, uh, we can acquire group of scans, okay? Uh, Always when we use the table, but on, not only when we use the table, we can decide to work using groups. And there is a way to build a group of scans. So uh, this is the best way for scanning an object. Okay, let's click here. Uh, we are defining a new group, so we type the name. Uh, inside the group, we tell the software how many point clouds we want to acquire. If we use the rotary table, means that we are uh, applying a step of, of 30 degrees, so 360 divided by 2 half. And here we have a few parameters about what we, uh, how we will handle the data. So if uh, at the end of the scan, we want to see only one object in our tree, we uh, turn off the explode object. If we want to see a folder with all the single scan listed, we can do it uh, turning on the explode object uh, um, option. We can also, in case we have some background and we don't want to lose time Cut in the background. We can click on the cut uh, table uh, with the table plane, and everything is below the uh, plane of the table uh, will be uh, will disappear in an automatic way. Here we have the alignment mode, so we are telling the software what kind of alignment we want to do during the multi-view acquisition. We are going to acquire many point clouds, uh, and we have, of course, to align each of them with the rest to get one uh, big uh, point cloud uh, correctly aligned. Uh, we have three ways to uh, run the alignment. We can use the uh, surface features, uh, I mean details of the surface of the object, um, recognized directly by the software, and used uh, as corresponding points to calculate the alignment uh, between two different point clouds. Of course, for doing that, you need an object with features, uh, which means that if the object uh, is a geometrical object, a mechanical object, this kind of alignment uh, is not the best one to be used. Or you can also uh, run the alignment using the markers applied to the object or on the table. So the software will use uh, the uh, centers of the markers for uh, running the alignment. In this situation, uh, um, 
the quality of the alignment is the best because it is not depending on the shape of the object. We estimate, we calculate the centers of the circles and we use them as uh, corresponding points. There is also an automatic alignment based on the table of the uh, on the axis of on the axis of the table. Uh, this one is the common one used with the table with the rotary table. Uh, of course, we have to calibrate the table. Uh, it takes a few seconds to tell the software where the table is uh, uh, respect to the scanner. Okay, so in this way, every time we acquire a point cloud, we know where the point cloud goes, we know its position, and the software is able to uh, um, apply the uh, correct uh, uh, metrics to uh, find the position of, of uh, that point cloud. Then we have a few additional parameters here are about the table, so the speed of the table, and how much delay uh, we ask the scanner, the software, uh, to wait uh, before starting a new scan after the movement. The process is always uh, uh, scan, then we move, then we stop, and then we scan again, then we move, we stop, we scan again. Uh, when we scan, we need the object stable. Uh, so if the object is heavy, uh, if it is not so easy to uh, fix it on the table, uh, it can be that at the end of the movement it has, uh, still has some vibrations. This is not good. Uh, so uh, to avoid that uh, uh, and to avoid the noise on the scans coming from the vibrations, uh, we uh, prefer to set a smaller um, speed of the table and maybe to increase the delay between the movement and the scan. Then more important here, you have two additional parameters about the color of the surface. Here, when we go from very dark to dark, normal, bright, and very bright, we just tell the software uh, a threshold, okay, being an optical scanner, what comes without a certain quantity of light is uh, not uh, so, uh, it is not so good, okay? Um, so uh, we, uh, what is uh, below a certain uh, threshold is at the end uh, a not valid point because uh, in that uh, acquisition the light was not enough in order to define a good uh, point. So uh, when we uh, are uh, bright or very bright, we tell the software an higher threshold where it's normal, it's a little bit uh, uh, smaller, this threshold. When we go to dark or very dark, we decrease this threshold because, of course, if we want to acquire a dark object or a very dark object and uh, we uh, um, use an high threshold, then uh, all points are not valid. But this is uh, for helping the software to avoid uh, to acquire uh, noisy scans. Then we have two additional parameters, high contrast and very high contrast. Uh, with this scanner, you can work in a good way also on multicolor uh, objects. So objects with dark and white parts together. Uh, of course, being an optical scanner, uh, the quantity of light needed for scanning the white part is not the same needed for scanning the dark part. If you scan the dark with the light used for the white, you get uh, noise on, on, the, on the dark. If you, on the other side, if you scan the white with the uh, light uh, needed for uh, the, the black, then you uh, see everything saturated on, on, uh, on the white. So again, the scan is not good. Uh, in with the high contrast and the very high contrast, the software is able to project different patterns with different exposures of the cameras uh, and merge together the results. So you get at the end only one point cloud uh, but uh, uh, it is very good even if uh, uh, the object has different colors, black and da uh, dark and white colors inside. And then there's uh, the acquisition type. So it can be base, robust, or very robust. The difference uh, when we move from base to robust and very robust is the quantity of the pattern projected and the images acquired. So we increase from base to robust and to very robust. Uh, of course, increasing the quantity of the pattern projected, we also increase the time needed for scanning an object, but we increase also the quality of the result. Uh, let's say if the object is ideal, like white, uh, you can stay on base, white and opaque, you can stay on base, not more than robust. Uh, if the object is quite ideal, so with some reflections or also not completely opaque, better if you go uh, with very robust or robust because uh, they are stronger. 
in this case, let's say, uh, let's, let's stay on base. Okay, and we confirm. Now we are in our scanning uh, page. Okay, here we can enter again the parameters in case we want to modify. We see an additional parameter here, which is the triple scan mode. Triple scan is used when we want to scan uh, uh, in a better way the cavities, uh, the holes. Uh, uh, being a triangulation uh, scanner means that uh, there's a distance between the two cameras and there's also an angle between the two cameras. And the scan, of course, is done uh, where uh, the two cameras are able to see together. So if you uh, consider the cavities, you can have situations where one camera uh, is uh, uh, having the correct information and the other one is uh, um, acquiring a shadow. So in this situation, uh, the result is a gap uh, in our point cloud. So to avoid too many gaps, we have developed this triple scan mode. Triple means that at the same time we are running three scans, the first one with both cameras, the second one using the projector and the, the right camera, and the third one we using the projector and uh, the uh, left camera. And then the software again merge everything together and you don't see three point clouds, you get just one. Uh, so, uh, the biggest part of the point cloud is done uh, using uh, the uh, two cameras together because it's also the best way to get quality. And where we have gaps, we fill the gaps using the information coming from the left and the right camera. Uh, only for the gaps. Using only one camera and the projector, the projector in the, is in the middle between the two cameras, so uh, the angle between the projector and one camera is half of the angle that we have between the two cameras, uh, which means that having a smaller angle, you can go deeper inside uh, the cavities. But it's, uh, let's say, a particular uh, feature to be used only uh, in some uh, particular situations uh, where you want to scan uh, cavities anyway. Okay, so here uh, the scanning button is uh, not enabled. Why? Because we have first to calibrate the position of the, of the table because we uh, told the software that we want to use the axis of the table for our uh, alignment, multi-view alignment. Let's have a look at the menu here. The three main uh, uh, sliders are the brightness, the exposure, and the camera gain. Here is to uh, control then I have the possibility to change the exposure and the gain of the cameras. Uh, both of them are used for scanning in a better way the dark parts. Uh, when I change the exposure, I just ask the cameras to stay for a longer time uh, acquiring light. So acquiring more light, uh, then uh, I see a better image. Uh, of course, a longer time means that also the scan is, uh, takes longer, okay? Uh, but I get good results on dark parts. On the other side, I can increase the gain. Okay, the gain is a kind of multiplier, is a kind of uh, uh, amplification that I'm going to apply to the signal coming from the cameras. So I don't modify the time needed for scanning the object, but of course, I'm uh, amplifying both the good uh, part of the signal and also the noise. So if I increase a lot, I for sure will see more noise on my scans. So if I want to scan dark parts and, and I don't care about the time, better if I increase the exposure. If I want to scan dark parts and I need a fast scan, but I don't care about the noise, I can increase the gain, okay? Always when I scan something, I need to avoid to scan in a situation uh, like this one. Red means that I have too much light, okay? Uh, I can accept some red, but not too much. Also because here we are projecting only white, then when we scan, we project both white and dark together because we project stripes. So uh, if I see some red here, uh, it's, it's acceptable because when I project the patterns, the quantity, the average quantity of light uh, decreases for sure. But of course, I need to avoid to scan the object uh, uh, in, a, in a dark situation, okay? Like this one, for example. Uh, both too much light and not enough light are not good for an optical scanner. So I always try to be in the middle in a situation like this one, for example, where I have some red, but we said uh, this is acceptable. Uh, so uh, before starting the scan, uh, better always to check 
the light and uh, change the exposure, the brightness, and the gain according to what uh, we want to uh, achieve. And another uh, parameter to uh, be uh, checked before scanning is the focus of this line projected by the projector. Always when uh, we have uh, this live section, the projector is projecting this line. Okay, uh, in case the line is not in a good focus condition, it is always better to modify the slider, the position of the slider on the projector and see here a good, uh, a good uh, uh, line. Uh, if the focus is not enough, um, then the result on the of the scan uh, are not good. You can understand uh, if you see them. Uh, when you scan, um, if you are with a very robust acquisition type, then uh, some uh, um, out of focus is acceptable. Uh, with robust and base, uh, better if the projector is uh, in a good focus uh, condition. And another uh, point that we have to uh, take care is the position of the object, of course. Uh, during the preparation of the setup, uh, you get uh, a distance. Uh, the distance between the scanner and the calibration plate and this distance is also the same you have to use when you scan the object the distance between the scanner and the object so uh, we have two ways to make sure that we are working at the correct distance one is to measure the distance the other one uh, faster uh, if uh, we see the two cameras uh, here uh, this dark line is inside the viewfinder okay uh, if i uh, move uh, the scanner closer to the object this line on the two cameras on the two images is moving the one on the left is moving in the right of the uh, image in the right part of the image the one on the uh, right is moving on the left part of the image so i will see the two lines more close to the borders of in the uh, the images in the middle when the scanner is closer to the object when i do uh, uh, when i move the scanner far too far from the object i see the other situation so the line is uh, more uh, is leaving of course the viewfinder and the one on the left is moving on the left the one on the right is moving on the right more close to the right border of the image and to the left border of the, the image on the left so the correct distance is is when the uh, line is on both images but also on one image because the setup is uh, is done when the line is more or less inside the viewfinder okay we don't need to measure nothing just see that the line is close to the viewfinder and then here we cannot scan now because the first step when we uh, decide to use the axis of the table is to calibrate this axis and for doing that of course the table has uh, uh, its uh, um, its calibration plate which is a small disc with some uh, uh, markers on uh, on the surface we just place the table the disc on the table and then we click on the calibration and calibrate so the software moves the table in a few positions and in this way we find the axis of the table this is something that we have to do every time we move the table uh, or the scanner or together okay now we are able to scan so just now just remove the calibration uh, plate from the table and place the object on the table okay first position is this one and then we start the scan okay so now the scanner is scanning then it moves then it scans the other position and every time we see a new point cloud appearing here if we go sharp assigned each color is a new point cloud for zooming the object we use the wheel of the mouse where depending on where we zoom it where the mouse is where we zoom it does also some pan to rotate the object we click uh, we keep clicked the right button of the mouse and we move the mouse and of course if we click on uh, the right button of the mouse then depending on where we are we can have the different menus okay so here we have different point clouds each color is a point cloud coming from different uh, point of view okay um, here we can also at this point we can ask 
uh, the table to rotate, then we can add another single point cloud for that point of view. So uh, we can try to uh, fill the gaps, but anyway, uh, we already did uh, 12 scans. So the best way to fill the gaps is to confirm this scan and then to scan the object from another point of view. So for confirming, we go next. And now we can see the folder here on our uh, window and with the single, all the single scans acquired available. And here for selecting the scans, we can use the uh, Windows uh, buttons. So if we hit Shift and then we click on the first one, we select everything is in the middle. If we hit Control, then here we click on this one and we uh, unselect. We click on this one and we unselect. We click again and we select. Or we go to the group and we do select. So now we are done with the first scan, which is the next step. The next step, according to our menu, which follow uh, the workflow used for scanning an object, is to uh, edit the scan. So to edit means to cut what is not the object. Uh, I can select the uh, required selector. The, the best one is the polygonal one. So if then I click on the uh, left button of my mouse and I keep it clicked and then I move, I do the lasso. Okay, and to close the selection, I double click and everything is red. When then I go here and I say crop, I'm canceling everything is not red. Or I can also use not the lasso, but the same tool. I click the left button of the mouse, then I move the mouse, then I click again, then I click, then I click, and then the, I do the polygonal selection. And again, to close, double click, and then I can uh, cut the selection. Every time I want to undo, double uh, right button of the mouse, and then I undo. And so uh, again, I see my points. I have also the possibility to remove the outlayers based on the distance, group of outlayers based on the angle. And also here is a, a good tool to be used with the table because this plane is always parallel to the table. When I click on a point or I move this slider, everything, I move the position of the, the plane, of course, and everything is below the plane is red. When I say apply, I'm going to cancel. Everything is red. Of course, again, I will undo. Uh, as a standard information in this software, every time I click on next, I confirm. Every time I click on previous, I cancel the wall uh, operation uh, I started. So if I click on previous here, I cancel the wall um, uh, editing I did. If I click on next, I confirm. Uh, of course, uh, what is below the object, the part, uh, the inner part of the object is still missing. Uh, and uh, the best way to acquire it is then to start a new scan, always a group scan, let's do with the same parameters. Uh, okay, we confirm. Here we still have the live session. And then the best is now to move uh, the object in a new position in order to scan what is uh, uh, inside the helmet. Uh, of course, here I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, uh, moving the table, I'm not moving the scanner, so I'm only uh, placing the object in a new different position. So this means that I will not uh, uh, have to um, do a new table calibration. Okay, now we have a little bit too much light, we see too much red because also uh, it depends on the orientation of the surface. So we can decrease a little bit. Okay, for example, in this way. And then uh, we start the new scan. So again, we are scanning the first position. And then we start the new scan. So again, we scan the first position, then th we move the object, we scan the second one, then we move again. Every time the alignment is done using the axis of the table. Then we start moving again. So uh, we are again collecting 12 different point clouds around the object placed with a different, uh, in a different, in a completely different position. Here we are acquiring a big part of the uh, uh, inside the inner surface of the object. 
Of course, uh, every time you want to uh, cancel the acquisition, you can do that, clicking on cancel. So then you can modify the parameters, for example, and start again the scan um, until when uh, you, you are done with your uh, required scans. Every time you cancel and you click again on scan, you are uh, overwriting uh, the, the, the scan you did uh, until that point, the object you, you built until that point. Okay, we are done also with this scan. So now we confirm again the scan. Okay, a new folder is appearing here with the new point clouds. Okay, then we edit again, we clean again uh, the scan. Uh, we need always to select what is uh, the noise or what is the uh, object. And then if we select the object, then we crop. If, if we select the noise, then we cancel. Okay. Here is uh, the scan. I would say we don't need to remove out layers because I don't see uh, noise coming from the out layers. So we go next. Of course, the second scan, if we turn on uh, the first and the second scan together, okay, with the control, uh, it in control, we select the two groups and then select all items, they are not aligned. Of course, this is because we moved the uh, helmet by hand and so uh, the software is unable to uh, understand where the second position is uh, uh, respect to the first one. So to align, uh, it's enough to click on the uh, scan that we want to move. Always when we align two scans, uh, one is moving, is floating, the other one is uh, the fixed one. So here uh, it is important to know uh, um, the difference between fixed and, and floating because if then we move uh, um, a scan already aligned, then uh, it is not aligned. But yeah, the first one is the one that we move, the first we select, and the second one, the second group we select here, we don't have uh, the possibility to select because we have only one group remaining, but this one will be the fixed one. Okay, so now we are moving the scan group two and the one remains fixed. Okay, the first alignment is done in an automatic way, okay, based on features. All always, uh, if now it's done in a perfect way, but in case uh, the software is unable to align uh, or in case we want to modify, we go here. Uh, here we have uh, the fixed one and the moving object, the floating object. Okay, uh, we can specify the points on the green and on the red. Uh, if one is not enough, we can add two, three, ten couple of points. And then the software is always finding the alignment. Uh, of course, you can zoom a lot. You can add all the cup, all the points you want, but the point here uh, on the red uh, will not be the one uh, on or exactly the one on the green, uh, even if in our head they are corresponding points. But uh, this is not needed. Okay, the uh, point on the red uh, is used only uh, for moving the red close to the green. Then when the two uh, point clouds are closed, uh, we uh, always apply the automatic algorithm finding the uh, best position, minimizing the distance between the two point clouds. Okay, so we can also try to increase the alignment uh, running a, another step. Uh, we are having a, an error of 18 micro microns, so now we can go next. Okay, so now the two point clouds are aligned. Uh, so we scanned, we cleaned, then we scanned again, we cleaned and we aligned. And we can go ahead with this process until when we don't say we are done with the acquisition means that we don't have big goals in our uh, scan. Here some parts are still missing, so we have to start a new scan. I would say always with the same parameters. We are changing again the position of the um, of the helmet always by hand.
And now we start a new scanning uh, process. So we click again, the light is good, the focus is good too. So we go and we scan. Other 12 scans coming uh, from another position of the helmet. Um, every time you have to, you want to uh, align an object on another, of course you need uh, uh, some parts in common, some surface uh, for finding the best uh, uh, to minimize, in order to minimize the distance uh, between the two uh, different objects, some surface has to be in common, but let's say uh, scanning with the rotary table we don't have the problem of having uh, parts in common because we, as you can see, we can always scan a big part of the object uh, of the helmet already scanned uh, in our uh, objects. Okay, we are done, we confirm, clicking on next, a third group appears, then we edit. Uh, yes, let's say that we select the helmet. Uh, if you hit control and then you select at the end, you unselect. So we have selected what we want to uh, keep, so we crop. Okay, again, this point cloud is not aligned with the rest of the object for the same reason. Okay, so we select scan group 3 and we align with the group 1, which is the one with the uh, big uh, uh, surface of uh, uh, the uh, helmet. Again, the automatic alignment works well, so we go next. So uh, the second has been aligned with the first, the third has been aligned with the first two, so means that if we select all of them, we have to see only one helmet. And if we move uh, to the sharp uniform and we check the point clouds, maybe we are done and we don't need to acquire more data. Okay, I would say we are done, I don't see big gaps, uh, let's do uh, selecting all the point clouds led, led to some more editing. So, for example, we try to clean, deleting some uh, uh, outlayers. Let's see if we create holes, we can always uh, undo and uh, clear the selection and make the removal with different parameters. Uh, okay. In this way, we remove less point, less points, only the noise. And then we can also try to remove the groups of points we have uh, here in the holes. Okay, group of groups of isolated points. Okay, the point is to, uh, the target is always to clean the point cloud, uh, but uh, not creating uh, holes. And, and then we go next. And so now we are ready to convert our point cloud in a, in a triangle mesh. Our big point cloud made by 36 single point clouds in a triangle mesh. Okay, uh, before doing that, we optimize the alignment between the single point clouds, which means that we tell the software the most important parameter is the search distance, which has to be smaller than uh, the smallest uh, thickness of the object and then we compute the optimization. Here the software is moving each single scan in order to find the best overlap to minimize the distance uh, between this scan and all the rest. And so uh, at the end, um, in a few uh, minutes, we can have uh, a better result. So, and here we also see all the numbers before the situation before the uh, global optimization. So we started from uh, an average distance of 51 uh, microns and at the end we have an average distance of 31 microns. So we have improved uh, the quality of the alignment of our uh, point clouds. 
So we are now ready for the creation of the mesh. Let's save. And then we start the mesh creation. Here we have a few parameters. Uh, that's the name uh, of the mesh. Uh, the maximum deviation we have set between the points and the triangles. Okay, uh, if we stay on the left, so we specify a small deviation, then we ask the software to follow all the uh, details of the object. So we will need more time to build the mesh and also it will create a big mesh. Uh, and the same is if we ask the software to build a very high detail mesh uh, instead of a normal one, a very high detail means that we, again, we ask to uh, build all the details. Uh, so uh, the mesh will have a big number of triangles. We can also limit this number of triangles during the mesh creation. Normally we prefer to leave it off and then we have the tools for decimating the mesh. We can fill the holes during the mesh creation. We tell the software that everything is be under the uh, 10, 10 millimeters of diameter can be uh, filled. We can compensate the spray if we apply it. And in case we need the color, we can also create the Atlas texture uh, representation of the color. When we are done with the parameters, we click on generate mesh. Here, the time needed is depending on, of course, how many point clouds we are uh, working on and also on the computer we are using. Uh, this time uh, is not um, a problem because we can work in parallel. Here, uh, let's say um, the button for acquiring new point clouds is available, so I can go ahead scanning. If I add other groups, uh, I can go ahead running my editing or running my alignment. I don't have to stay here waiting for the mesh creation. Um, I can work on the rest of my project uh, while it builds this mesh. Um, let's see what happens now. Uh, when we are at 45%, we have already uh, we are already at the end of the mesh creation. But after the mesh creation, the software does also um, a kind of uh, deep mesh doctor on the mesh to uh, be sure that uh, uh, mesh uh, will uh, be uh, very good without uh, uh, problems. So here is our mesh. When we click on it, then uh, we see uh, the mesh. We can also change the assigned color. OK, here if I show the wireframe, we are having triangles now. OK, let's move on the options. And here we select from the rendering better color for our mesh. Okay, so now uniform and we also turn off the wireframe. So uh, here we don't have a point cloud, here we have a triangle mesh. So uh, now what we can do on the triangle mesh is, uh, uh, of course, we can export, okay, 
uh, we specify the folder, the file format, and we export, or we can run some editing on the triangle mesh. So we can select parts and cancel or crop. Of course, uh, being a mesh, we can select in a visible, what is visible, or uh, we can select everything in a pass-through mode. I mean, if I select in a visible mode, for example, I select here, what is behind is uh, still unselected. If I, on the other side, if I uh, move to the pass-through mode, then I select, I select this face, but I select also the other face, okay? Um, I can fill the holes, single holes, also on a partial mode, okay? Uh, I can also select uh, uh, the holes in a multiple way, so I specify uh, a dimension, and all the holes uh, with the dimension smaller than this one will be uh, filled. So for example, here we have an hole, we can uh, tell the software partial, and here it is good to uh, use the flat mode. So we go and we click the first second, and then we want to fill this part of the hole. Okay, this is filled. Or we can uh, select the dimension of the biggest hole we want to fill, and then uh, we specify what kind of strategy to be used. So between flat curvature and high curvature, and then we tell the software uh, to fill everything. We can also unselect some holes because uh, we don't want to fill them, maybe. Also the other one inside. So we are going to fill only the red uh, boundaries. And now we fill selected. Okay. We can the feature. So if, for example, this is for us uh, something that we want to cancel, we select it, and then with the feature, uh, it is like to open a mole and then fill it uh, uh, with a, um, a curvature on the boundary. We can flip the normals, we can run the mesh doctor, so we tell the software what we want to uh, fix, and then we fix. Uh, let's say if the mesh is a good mesh, so without big problems, you don't see nothing at the end of this process, we are only fixing the topology of, of the mesh. Uh, but if it already comes uh, with a good topology, then uh, you don't see differences. In this software, of course, you can also import meshes coming from other software, so you can run this, uh, all these tools also on other meshes. And then we have three other interesting functions. This one is for decimating the mesh. So I want to, here we have more or less four million of triangles. We want uh, a mesh with less triangles. We want to export a smaller file. We specify uh, what we want to go, where we want to go, what, how many triangles we want to uh, achieve, and then we give to the software tolerance. Uh, and when we start the decimation, then uh, the software is always uh, working according to the tolerance. So if, uh, for example, I specify a very small number of triangles, uh, uh, I will not find then uh, the model done with this small number of triangles because the software will uh, find uh, um, an error bigger than uh, a deviation, uh, a difference of the resulting object compared to the original one bigger than the tolerance that I have specified. So every time, because of course uh, you have uh, a model made by triangles and we are, uh, in order to decimate, we want to substitute small triangles with bigger triangles. This is uh, always, this always introduce an approximation of the model so the software for each step is checking that uh, 
this uh, deviation uh, comparing the uh, result uh, with the original one is below uh, the tolerance specified. If for some reasons it is uh, bigger than the tolerance, then it stops. This means then if I start from 10 million and I want the object described by uh, 10,000 uh, uh, triangles, but the tolerance has to be uh, two microns at the end, uh, in a short time the software uh, will stop the decimation and instead of 10,000, I will find my object defined by, not by 10 million, but, but by uh, 7 million of triangles. We can also remove the spikes, so the software is able to, uh, uh, in an automatic way, to select uh, the spikes according to a, a sensitivity of the time uh, specifying, and then when we uh, click on remove spikes, we uh, remove them, so we improve the quality of, uh, of the resulting object. And the last one, the last tool, uh, is a smart smoothing. Uh, always, when you run some, sm some smoothing on a, on a triangle mesh, uh, to smooth a triangle mesh means that uh, uh, you are uh, removing the noise, uh, which means that uh, if you do that on, a, on, a, on an edge or, uh, uh, or, or on a small radius, then uh, uh, you increase the radius. Uh, and if it is an edge, then you destroy the edge. So every time you smooth something, even if you work with the tolerance, uh, at the end you are destroying uh, the edges. In our uh, smart smoothing, we have the possibility to specify always a sensitivity. Uh, according to this sensitivity, the software is able to find the edges, uh, the positive and the negative edges. And then when we filter, we filter only what is not an edge. And what is an edge is improved. Now we are at the end of the uh, uh, spikes uh, removal. So you see that the object looks better. You can always undo all the, uh, the, the, the steps you do, you can undo and also redo. Okay, let's now see the smoothing. Okay, according to the sensitivity, the software finds uh, the edges, the blue negative edges, the orange are positive edges or a small radius. And what is gray is something that I can, um, uh, that is flat for me, so I can uh, uh, then smooth it. Okay, so then I specify a strength. I always specify a tolerance, so the maximum deviation that I accept uh, uh, for the result, okay, so that my, if I tell 10 microns, uh, not depending on the rest of the parameters, uh, my result will be uh, within the 10 microns compared to the uh, original one. And then when I smooth, I'm uh, smoothing only what is gray and I'm improving, um, I'm enhancing the edges, the orange and the blue uh, part. So I'm saving my edges, but not uh, only, I'm also improving the quality of my edges using this tool. Of course, if I uh, set my sensitivity at, at zero, then uh, the whole object is gray, and then when I uh, smooth, I smooth everything.